You might remember this. This was a scene on Wall Street in New York five years ago when the Occupy movement took off. Protesters filled the streets to speak about economic inequality between the rich minority and the rest of the population, the so-called 99%. Shortly thereafter, similar rallies popped up in other cities across the world, including here in BC. And uh, we have got one of the co-founders of that protest right now. He's just written a book about uh, the end of protest. We'll explain that uh, with uh, Michael White in a moment. Michael, thank you so much for coming thank you. Uh, and, and talking to us. My pleasure. Just take us back to the Wall Street movement, first of all, and how that started. Yeah, I mean, it was amazing. Basically, if you go back to that magical time of 2011, there mm. was, at first, there was this kind of uprising in Egypt, where the people of Egypt went into Tahrir Square and they said, Mubarak must go. And then when Mubarak did step down, it spread to Spain. And all of a sudden, the people of Spain started going into their squares and they had started having these general assemblies. And so at the time, I was an editor at Adbusters, and we basically sent out an email to our network and he said, OK, everyone, if we can combine what's happening in Egypt, which is to go into a place of symbolic importance, and combine that with Spain, which is to have these general assemblies, and we bring that to Wall Street, well, we can kick off a revolutionary moment. So how does that actually happen? How do you rally everyone together? Well, I think social movements, concretely speaking, are created out of three things. First, you have to have a willing historical moment. The time has to be right. Then you have to have a contagious mood. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was a kind of mood of fearlessness. Everyone was losing their fear. We're not afraid of Mubarak anymore, you know? And then you combine it with a new tactic. So Occupy Wall Street had a new tactic, which was get into these general assemblies. We're going to come up with our one demand and have this new form of democracy. Right. So you really tapped into the momentum of people just being really frustrated with the greed and the corruption and all of that going on. Absolutely. But this then spreads. I mean, it spreads like wild fire and it goes into over 80 countries yeah. and just take me back to that I mean did you realize that it was going to be this big <laughs> well I think it definitely exceeded our imagination but I knew that something amazing was going to happen because within 24 hours of putting out the idea for Occupy Wall Street it was taken up by local activists mm -hmm. but the, but the thing to remember is that actually Occupy was pretty much ignored for the first week but then a series of basically flukes happened first these women got pepper sprayed by the police and that got a lot of national attention but then 700 people got arrested on the Brooklyn Bridge and when that happened all of a sudden the movement spread everywhere what's the backstory though I'm really curious most kids go to school and they get a regular job and you know we might have like strong political views but uh, we can't organize stuff like this so what's what made you because you you were a, a, a huge activist and organized quite a lot of stuff when you were a teenager as well yeah. so what made you different <laughs> what and made I mean me different di kindly yeah. well you know yeah, no, I understand. you always get people of a certain generation and I think for our generation it's you yeah. um, who we will remember like it your name is in history because right. you you were the leader that basically and everyone and then fo followed huh. your movement so what, what happened that what happened in your childhood that made <laughs> you so so active well you know I think that I've been an activist since I was 13 years old and so it's something that's it's like it's like asking someone like why why are you into music why are you why are you a painter it's just it's been my, my 13 so young like what was going yeah. on at the time in your in your life where uh, it made you angry enough to to say something about it I don't think it came out of a feeling of anger so much as I became very good at identifying leverage points, places where if you were to put a tiny amount of pressure, all of a sudden a huge amount of, of stuff happens. Okay. And that's what Occupy is. You know, we, yeah. yeah. This book now, though, is tipping all of that on its head. Right. And you're saying it's the end of protest. Right. And actually, that is not the way to get your message across or create a better world. Break that down for us. Well, I think what's the key insight is that the end of protest doesn't mean the absence of protest. It means that we live in a time of the proliferation of ineffective protest. That sounds... Uh, deep. <laughs> yeah, it is. But basically the core idea is that we have more protests now than ever before in human history, more frequent protests than ever in, before in human history, but that these protests don't work. And that activists need to start understanding that this, this paradigm we've been chasing, this theory we've been chasing of get millions of people into the streets, largely nonviolent, it doesn't work. And so we need a new theory of social activism. Which is what? What would bring about change now then? I think the core thing to realize is that we need to use social movements in order to gain sovereignty. We need to use social movements in order to win elections in multiple countries to carry out a unified political agenda. So I'll give you an example. We had the Panama Papers recently, right? Right. And I bet that uh, you definitely read into that. And uh, we've, we just get an idea of, of the amount of wealth and the majority of wealth in our, in our world and, and who's shifting what to where and how, how they're doing this. So how would you protest something like that today? Well, I think the core thing about the Panama Papers, what it reveals is that basically 
everywhere people are facing the same enemy. It doesn't matter if you live in the UK, Canada, Pakistan, it doesn't matter. Basically, we live in a world that's dominated by this uber-rich 1% who, who uses their money to control the political process at the very same time as they hide their money from the tax man. And so what the Panama Papers reveals is that we need to build a global social movement that gives power to the 99%. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, the key insight is that if we want to stop the situation, we have to gain sovereignty. America is a, is a big player in the world economy. Uh, you're from Oregon. Thoughts on the U.S. presidential election right now? <laughs> well, definitely, I think but, uh, both Trump and Bernie Sanders are symptomatic of Occupy Wall Street. They, they are symptomatic of the fact that people are desperate for real change in America, and they realize that the old methods of protest are broken. Um, but I think that they're both also a regression back to this faith in leaders, and that what we really need is to put our faith in the social movement. The who, social movement will get. Who would power. you vote for? Who would I vote for? I'm not voting for either one. I'm going to vote for the social movement that comes up that, that gains power. Which is no one, right? <laughs> not yet. It's happening, though, in Spain with Podemos and other places. Right. Mike, thank you very much for coming in. It's been a real pleasure talking to you, and good thank luck you. with the book. It was a pleasure. Uh,